ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Charles Marshall. about being here. I thought I might start off with a little bit of good news for you. I know a lot of people have been stressed out about the high gas prices. Have they been beating you up a little bit? Have they? Have you? Yes. And, and I knew they, would, they had been, so I thought I might give you some good news. I heard a commercial on the way over here tonight from a local car dealership. They are offering a special deal, get this, whereby if you buy a new vehicle, they will give you a coupon worth $1,000 worth of free gas. Have you heard that commercial? I'm not making that up. It's a real commercial. $1,000 worth of free gas, which is a great deal because if you do the math, that's right at about half a tank full. So you're going to want to take advantage of that. So I needed tonight, I needed a little stress relief. I've had a rough couple of weeks. I had to get my picture taken uh, by a professional photographer for some promo shots. I do not like getting my picture taken. I, I, I don't know why they always have to pose you and position you. It really bothers me. I don't know why you can't just come in, you sit down, you smile, they take your picture, but instead, for some reason, they always put you into these weird poses, all these weird positions that you never use in real life, do you? You're never actually seen in any of these positions in real life. It's never like you're walking down the street, you go, hey, Steve, how are you doing today? <laughs> Not bad, Charles. How about you? <laughs> Pretty good. Thanks for asking. <laughs> so I go in there. It's like these guys have a bet with their other photographer buddies over just how contorted of a position they can get you into. See if this looks familiar. I went in there. And it's like the, the guy says, all right, Mr. Marshall, I want you to put your right leg up on the stool. Lean forward, if you would, with your left arm on your right leg. Go ahead and drape that right arm on top of the left arm and pull the right shoulder up and then oh, drop it down a little bit. Move the chin down and then back toward the next shoulder. No, relax, Mr. Marshall, relax. <laughs> People were looking at my picture right now on my website going, Charles Marshall, who is that? Oh, I remember, he's that comedian that looks like the hunchback from Notre Dame. <laughs> I tell you what, though, if you don't hear anything else tonight, you need to listen to this. You should never, ever, ever allow the photographer to adjust the tilt of your head. You know what I'm talking about? You cannot defeat the tilt. Some of you are nodding your heads. If you don't believe me, go home tonight, practice your smile in the mirror, take your normal smile, tilt it down too far, all of a sudden you look demonic. <laughs> Weird thing is, you take that exact same smile, tilt it too far the other way, all of a sudden you look insane. It's crazy. So I appreciate you being here tonight. You could have been doing anything. You could have stayed home and watched television. I like TV. Does anybody in here like watching television? Of course you do. I got my favorite. I have my favorite uh, shows just like you. I like that uh, Jerry Springer show. I like that. Uh, no. Don't treat me like that. I gotta watch the Jerry Springer show. It's the only way I can keep up with what's going on in my family. <laughs> you watch the Jerry Springer show, you go, isn't that ridiculous? I watch it and I go, isn't that Uncle Bernie? <laughs> now what happens when you start talking like that is people think that your family's trashy, but can I defend my, t my family for a second? Because not all my family's trashy. As a matter of fact, get this, I recently found out that one of my cousins is a pharmacist which I thought was kind of cool, because in my family, that's a big deal. We've never had a pharmacist in my family. It's, it's need to be able to say to people that I've got a real pharmacist. Okay, not a real pharmacist. He really just makes the crystal meth in his kitchen. <laughs> it sounds better to say pharmacist. <laughs> Very cool. It's been hot lately. It's been a little warm as of the, ta the taping. Of it. And you know what? They're, they're blaming it on. You know what people are blaming it on? The global warming, that's exactly right. If it's too hot, it's too cold, they blame it on global warming. And I thought that was weird, but I thought, you know what? Every generation has something they blame the weather on. Isn't that true? We all done that. Now, this generation is global warming. My generation, do you remember what we blamed it on? El Nino, remember that, El Nino? If it rains too much, it's El Nino. Now, my parents' generation, some of you here tonight, you guys blamed it on El Atomic Bombo. Do you remember that? <laughs> So it's cool, I live right here in this area, 
And it's so cool to be doing an event because I travel all over the country. I travel about 100,000 miles a year and I fly all the time. Does anybody in here fly very much in your uh, line of work or uh, maybe uh, on vacation? Anybody been on a plane before? Has any, anybody ever seen a picture of an airplane? They have really tightened up on that airport security out there, haven't they? And it's always something just silly that they do when they decide they're going to get tough. When they first started doing this, I kid you not, I was walking through the metal detector and they confiscated my fingernail clippers. Do you remember that? that my fingernail clippers, because of that little one-inch nail file on there, supposed to be very dangerous, so they took them away. They confiscated them, which worried me because I'm thinking, now what am I going to do if I get into a fight? <laughs> Before, as a force to be reckoned with. You want a piece of me? Oh, you want a piece of me? <laughs> Is that where we are now? Are these things now considered lethal weapons? Are people holding up banks and liquor stores with these things? <laughs> Everybody get your hands up. Nobody moves. Nobody gets manicured. <laughs> it's crazy. So then what happened? Let's follow the trend, shall we? So then what happened? About a couple of years ago, some numbskull somewhere tried to uh, make a bomb out of his tennis shoes. Do you remember that? So what does that mean? That means all the rest of us have to take off our shoes now and put them on the conveyor belt. Then so a, couple of, a couple of numbskulls over in England decided they were going to make a bomb out of toothpaste tubes. Now that means all of the rest of us have to take our liquids, gels, and aerosols and put them on the conveyor belt. And I'm thinking that it's only going to be a matter of time before some nut job out there learns to make a bomb out of pants. <laughs> it's going to be, sir, please put your pants on the conveyor belt. <laughs> Let me tell you, for me, that's where the fight begins because they can beat me up, they can haul me off to jail, but by jingo, my pants are going with me. I don't think I'm the only one that feels that way, am I? I didn't think so. No. I am not saying you don't need to pay attention to the safety announcements on the plane. By all means, do it. Whenever the plane takes off, whenever the plane lands, they tell you to please return your seat to the upright position, stow all tray tables. But it's an amazing thing to me that the position of your seat on an airplane can even be considered a safety hazard in the first place because they only recline three inches anyway, don't they? <laughs> Listen, here's your seat in the upright position. This is fully reclined. <laughs> And for some reason, the people in the airline industry have determined that this position perfectly safe, nothing can happen to you, no turbulence, get to your gate on time. This one, very dangerous. <laughs> Want the plane to crash? Uh -huh. Get that seat up. <laughs> Tragedy averted. I got my pet peeves though. My pet peeve on a plane is I wish people would learn how to lock the doors on those airplane bathrooms. <laughs> Such a simple mechanism. All you do is you go in there, you turn around, you slide the lever shut. It says occupied, it locks the door, but either people don't know how to do this or they forget to do it, but it creates a very awkward situation for the next person in line, doesn't it? Have you ever been the next person in line and done the accidental door opening thing? Have you? Be honest. I, listen, I have too many times and quite frankly, I get a little tired of seeing that, that shock, panic expression on the guy's face as he frantically tries to grab the door handle. I'll tell you the truth, sometimes just to teach him a lesson, I'll hold the door handle just out of his reach. Hear this what you want, buddy? Better learn how to lock the door next time, won't you? Hey everybody, forgot to lock the door right here. I was in the rural south, out away from the big city a couple of months ago doing the airplane bathroom door bit. This woman on the front row said, I thought I recognized you from somewhere. <laughs> I do have my pet peeves though. You know what one of my pet peeves is the secondhand smoke? Let me ask you a question. Who, is there anybody in here that wants to rid the world of secondhand smoke from tonight forward? Anybody interested in that? Yeah? Let me tell you. Let me tell you how to do it. If you will just do this one thing, it'll be gone inside of a week. Watch this. 
Watch this. Next time somebody goes over to you and lights up their cigarette and starts breathing their smoke at you, you turn around to them, you look them dead in the eye, and you start singing Barry Manilow songs at them at the top of your lungs. <laughs> and listen, buddy, you better man up and sing Barry. Don't you just phone it in. You go ahead and sing it. At the Copa, Copacabana, the hottest spot north of Havana. At the Copa, Copacabana. Hey, music and fashion are always the fashion at the Coba Bumba they fell in love there. now if listen now watch if if he starts to look annoyed or he has any complaint at all you look back at him and say oh I'm sorry is my second hand singing getting on your nerves <laughs> I'd hate that I'd hate to think that, because you see, I gotta sing, I'm addicted to Barry. <laughs> Excuse me, I need another hit. Music and fashion, we're always the fashion. Oh yeah. No. You know, we're talking about the airports, and of course everybody's still scared to death, and that's because we haven't found haven't found Osama yet. We're still out there looking for Osama. Have not found Osama bin Laden yet. And we've been looking for him for a long time. And I gotta, I gotta, let me go on record. I don't think that's our soldiers' fault. I don't. I support our soldiers. I think that's our fault because we sent men, and men can't find anything. Am I right, ladies? <laughs> Tell me. Be honest. You know it's true. You know those, those guys. Those guys are driving up and down Baghdad Road, looking at their maps, and uh, Osama's waving at them as they go by. And, Amazing things going on, though, man. I, uh, I just read an article not too long ago. Get this, but, uh, that they're starting to install defibrillators in public places like airports, churches, and malls for the general public to use. Does that sound like a bad idea to anybody else in here but me? I got to tell you, I'm not ready for the general public to be practicing medicine on my body. I'll tell you what I'm talking about. I was out at the airport the other day. I drifted off for a couple of minutes. I woke up five minutes later with my shirt ripped open, diodes attached to my chest, people leaning over me saying, hit him again, turn on the power, hit him again. You know, at the very least, the kids are going to get into them. Wouldn't, wouldn't you? I would. If I was a kid, if I was a kid, I'd grab those things and try to reenact every medical drama I had ever seen in my life. We're losing this one clear, Kajunga. I need more power, Kajunga. You know, at the very least, they're going to go, I wonder what would happen if I, Kajunga. Amazing times that we live in, though. We got pills for everything, don't we? They don't, you don't have anything wrong with you that they don't make a pill to try to fix. They may not cure you, but they can sell you a pill. Am I right? It's true. It's true. I saw a, a commercial the other day for a pill. It's called Propecia. This is a real pill. It's called Propecia. It is a hair replacement pill. And I was very interested in this product because I've got a friend of mine who I thought might be able to... Uh, <laughs> What? <laughs> the bald thing didn't catch me by surprise. I knew it was coming my way all my life because we have baldness on both sides of my family as far back as you can go. Let me tell you what I'm talking about. On my father's side, my father was bald. My grandfather was bald. My great-grandfather was bald. I'm told that my great-great-grandfather was bald. On my mother's side, same thing, my mother was bald. <laughs> My grandmother was bald, so I didn't have a chance. You got medicine for everything. I saw a commercial the other day for the toe fungus medicine. Have you seen that commercial? You got the toe fungus, don't you, buddy? I got, I'm, reading a, I'm reading the toe fungus thing right here. Don't you laugh. I'm reading it right here, too, buddy. I'm just reading the toe. You know what? I, I have it, too. Do you mind if I ask you, do yours glow in the dark? Because I don't... 
It's scary though. It's scary. I tell you what's scary about it though is the disclaimer at the end of the commercial. Have you seen the disclaimer? They say, now get this, they say it might cause stomach upset or skin rash, but it, it might also cause liver damage or kidney failure. Can I translate that for you, buddy? That means you keep using that medicine, you're going to have the best looking feet in the entire morgue. All right? <laughs> is this your wife? Is she the one suggesting you use that medicine, is she? Look, she's not even paying attention. She's all spending the life insurance check right now. <laughs> Oh, man. Uh, you know what? You, you guys married? Do we have any single people in here tonight? Raise your hand if you're single. Anybody single tonight? Anybody single at all? We have a couple people. Anybody wish they were single? Let's try that. Oh, my goodness. You put that hand down, buddy. You put that hand down. I'm telling you why. Because, you see, you don't, you don't realize yet. Can I, can I explain something to you? All you guys, are you taking care of your woman? Are you taking care of your woman? Are you? Because you got to when you reach middle age. You got to take care of them. Because, let me tell you, I have friends that think they're going to go out and get a hot young babe like they did 20 years ago, 30 years ago, if something happened between them and their wife. Isn't that just crazy? Can I put it in business speak so you guys will understand? Ladies, would you like me to do that for you? I'll do it for you. Okay. All right, here's how it works. When you and I first went on the market, okay, a number of years ago, our product was selling at an all-time high, trading was vigorous, and we were a hot commodity. Am I right? Tell me the truth. Back me up. But since that time, now this is going to hurt. Since that time, a couple of things have happened. First, recession hit, all right? And then inflation, all right? So that, and I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings tonight, I'm so going to put this as delicately as I can, so that your stock value has plummeted. <laughs> Hot young babes don't even see you anymore. They see an empty chair where you're sitting right now. <laughs> Me too, they're just seeing a, a microphone standing up here in the air talking by itself. <laughs> now, where's all that sound coming from? But I don't want you to be discouraged. God forbid if anything happens between you and your wife or ever happened to your wife, you still have markets wide open available to you. For example, right here, like, like this guy right here, you are still testing very high in the 80-year-old and up market, okay? <laughs> oh, I'm telling you, you're a hot young thing in their market. They, they like you. Let me tell you what, you, you, are, you are a tasty little treat. You're eye candy to them, buddy. Oh, they like you. Oh, yeah. I'm telling you. They, they love, they love the young guys, and, and that's defined as any guy without a pacemaker. <laughs> Listen, this is true. You go visit your girlfriend out of the nursing home, and, and her friends are going to drool over you guys. <laughs> well, they might just be drooling in general, <laughs> but there's going to be some drooling going on. Oh my goodness. Now, let, let me tell you the truth. If you're single and you need some dating interest, you know one of the quickest ways you can get people knocking on your door? Go get you a couple of billion dollars. <laughs> Isn't that right? Isn't that true? You're going to have somebody knocking on your door if you've got money. Listen, Donald Trump would not be dating supermodels if he drove a Ford Fiesta, okay? <laughs> and while we're on the subject, I would rather look like this than like that. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. You know what? I said I was a hot commodity. I'm just telling you. know, I never was a hot commodity. I stunk at dating. I did. I was so bad at dating. You've never seen anybody. Listen, I saw a commercial the other night for a furniture store finance plan that reminded me of my dating life before I was fortunate enough to meet my wife that said no interest for the first three years. <laughs> it wasn't funny back then either. Oh, man, 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 man. I, did, I am married, though. My wife and I just celebrated our 18th wedding anniversary. Thank you. Thank you. And listen, listen, you would love my wife. My, you would love my wife. She's got such a cool sense of humor. She likes to pick on me because I'm the comedian guy. So she likes to try to get me whenever she can. We were, uh, last Friday night, we were in Blockbuster Video. And it, you know how it is on Friday night. It's real crowded, people standing all around us. And, and in a loud voice, she points at the shelf and said, Hey, honey, look, there's that Brokeback Mountain movie you've been wanting to see. <laughs> I tell you, I was embarrassed. I, I was so embarrassed I had to put my copy of it back on the shelf. That's how embarrassed I was. It 
is tough, though, in the dating world. I'm so glad that I'm not dating anymore because it was tough, especially as a man. Because I, as a man, you've got to look cool and act cool when you go approach the woman for a date. Isn't that true? It, the women don't want to get some guy walking up to him shaking like a wet chihuahua, do you, ladies? Do you? <laughs> be honest. You don't, want, you don't want some guy walking to you going, excuse me, I thought maybe, perhaps, I thought you'd leave me. I thought maybe you you. See, that's the look I used to get right there. Where the face is smiling, but the eyes say restraining order. <laughs> no, no, no. Women want guys who are cool, smooth, calm, suave, sophisticated. That's why I have always been thankful that we men don't have tails like dogs. Because <laughs> if you think that a dog is thinking or feeling, you can tell just by looking at his tail, can't you? Men, can you imagine how difficult it would be to ask a woman out on a date if you had a tail? <laughs> You're like, hey, couldn't help but notice you from across the road. You come here often or is this your first time? <laughs> my name's Frank, but my friends call me Sparky. <laughs> Some of you ladies look like you recognize that technique. <sighs> oh my goodness. But men don't have a clue. Men don't know. Men don't know what women want. But I thought by way of public service announcement, I thought I might give you men just a little bit of advice, just three words of advice. If you take this, listen, if you take three words of advice, women will never look at you the same way. Your woman will never see you the same way again. Three little words. Are you ready? Here they are. Nose, hair, trimmer. <laughs> they make them. Buy one. Use it regularly. Because I do a lot of these events and I see men walking around with complete mustaches growing out of their nostrils. <laughs> and it is the women right now that are laughing because you're thinking of specific names and faces, aren't you? <laughs> Sitting right next to them. You know what I'm talking about. The men, though, the men are looking a little uncomfortable. Some of them look like they want to slip their hand up on a covert reconnaissance mission. Check the situation out, find out if they have anything to worry about. Good to see you. Hey. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Target acquired. I'm going in. I'm serious. After we finish tonight, I'll go in the men's restroom. I'll find little black hairs all over the lavatory. It's true. It is true. You can always tell, though, when a relationship starts to get serious. You know how? The woman starts trying to fix the man. It's a good thing, guys. When she starts doing that, she, she is investing in you, but they feel that they must do this. This is encoded into their DNA. They've got to do this regardless of time, date, or occasion. They've got to do this. They must do this. I'll give you an example. I wanted to take my wife out to a fancy dinner the other night, so we're out at the Waffle House. And I, no, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking that's a lot of money, but it was our anniversary. I'm looking at her saying things like, honey, I love you so much. She's looking back at me saying things like, uh-huh, when you get home, you need to shave your ears. <laughs> but why? Because listen, a man, a man sees and falls in love with a woman, but a woman sees and falls in love with a renovation project. <laughs> That's what she's looking for. And I'm looking around tonight, ladies. We got some real fixer-uppers in here tonight. <laughs> Good pickings. I, that's why I think that if you guys, are, you single guys are going to write a personal ad, just write one that counts. I don't have anything against personal ads, whether it's, it's on the internet or, or in the newspaper. Just write one that counts. Don't write one of these wimpy little single male, six attractive female, likes long walks. That's going to put her to sleep. You need to target it toward the renovation mindset. Write it like a real estate ad. Write something like quaint little fixer upper needs TLC. <laughs> Handy woman special. There are differences, aren't there? There are differences between men and women. One thing women can do, and most women, there are some women who can do this, but generally speaking, most women cannot give driving directions. No, God bless you, you're trying. God bless you, I know you're trying because you're very detailed, but that's the problem. You ask a woman how to get from here to there and she'll landmark every single item from here to there. Okay, you go to this first red light, okay, there's a bank on the one side right on the corner there, and it's got a big sign, it turns round and round, it's got the time on one side, the temperature on the other. <laughs> Normally the temperature is about two to three degrees warmer because the sun's shining right on it. <laughs> right across the street from there, there's a McDonald's with a big, big play land, and there's a Toys R Us right behind there, okay, you keep going right through that red light. <laughs> At the very next light, is that the one I turned in? Uh-uh, but there's a Walmart there with 25% off all their fashion jewelry this week. 
<sighs> so uh, my wife and I, I'm saying we celebrated our 18th wedding anniversary. We're very excited about that. We have children. Let me tell you about my family. Very excited. I got two uh, children. They're at home right now. My, my little girl is five years old. Her name is Faith. And then I've got a little boy, and he, he is three years old, and him, his name is Wesley. And I, I love these kids so much. I am just, I'm enthralled with them. I could talk about them all day. A lot, you know what, though? I can tell I've lost a lot of the women right now. Because <laughs> you're doing the math. You remember I said I was married uh, 18 years. You're wondering what I'm doing with little... If I promise to explain it, can we just move on? Would that be all right with you? Okay, here's how it is. It's going to go quick. For the first 13 years of our marriage, we had no kids. Are you with me so far? And then the following two years, we had two kids. You're thinking, my word, what happened there? We read a book. <laughs> it was a good book, but we're not going to read it any kind, anytime soon. I love having kids, though, man. I love having my children. And I did not wait until they were born before I started trying to connect with them. I did this thing where the daddy talks to the baby with, while the baby's still in mommy's tummy. So when, have you heard about this? The thinking is, so when the baby, the baby he hears dad's voice, the baby learns dad's voice. So when the baby is delivered, the child recognizes dad's voice and you have a relationship with that child. And I thought that was so cool. So I did that every day. And forgive me, I don't mean to get all emotional and sentimental. I just love these kids. I get down there and say all those daddy things that daddies always say to the kids. I got right down there and said, you listen to me when I'm talking to you. <laughs> Don't you turn away from me. <laughs> Just binding with my babies. <laughs> Love a kids. People do not raise kids these days the same way as a lot of us were raised. A lot of people don't even spank their kids anymore. I don't know about you, but when I grew up, I got a spanking or two. Did anyone in here get a spanking when you grew up? Go ahead and raise your hand up there. Be proud of it. Show the world. Let them know. We got spanking. Of course, we didn't call it getting a spanking, did we? What we called it sounded a whole lot more ominous. We called it getting a whooping or a whooping. Or a whipping. Same word, different neighborhood right over here. So I just... <laughs> they had to. We didn't have all these modern parenting techniques like time out. Time out hadn't been invented back when I was growing up. I wish it had been because listen to this. My parents had five kids. They didn't know anything about time out. Listen, they, my parents thought time out was the break they got in between whipping all of us five kids. <laughs> It's crazy. You see, you see the kids acting up in the grocery store. Have you seen that? The kids acting up in the grocery store. The parent hasn't even seemed to notice. Stressing out the rest of the store. Finally, get, the parent gets a, a clue when they see the rest of us heading over to the kid with pitchforks, clubs, and torches. And they throw. What do they do when they when they get serious? They threaten the kid. We're counting to ten. Have you seen that? You better not. I'm going to count to ten. What's up with that? Like the kid's going to be scared of big numbers or something? <laughs> no, not hit seven, seven if you had, not double digits, please, not double digits, I'm sorry. <laughs> My mama. Thank you, I appreciate it. My mama would have started spanking me right there in the, in the back of the store, spanking me all the way out of the store. It didn't care who was watching. It was a different age back then. Mamas weren't so concerned with who might see back then. It, 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 total strangers would help your mama spank you out of the store. It was a community project. And let me say, when I say all the way there in the back of the store, let me, let me tell you what I'm talking about. We could have been all the way back there in fabrics. Are you with me? We could have been all the way back there in baby clothes. And how many of you have discerned, I'm describing your typical discount department store floor plan. Did anybody get that? Oh, no, hold on. Listen, I know more of you have been inside a Kmart or a Walmart than that. I see what some of y'all are wearing. All right? It's true. Because I, I grew up wearing Kmart clothes and I lived in terror of something known as the blue light special. My mom, this is true, my mom would go back there in the, in the 1970s and go, go to the Blue Light Special and buy me like six pairs of pants for a dollar. Next day, I'm wearing these things at school. And let me tell you what, you cannot look cool in 17 cent pants. Hey. I 
I tell you what, you young people back here, if you go to school looking like this, you better go with your game on, am I right? Because kids are not friendly about this type of uh, attire. You better at least have a good backstory going. My friends be like, where'd you get the pants, Charles? I'd be like, Paris? These are called Capri pants. They're fashionable in 25 years. Mama would go back there in the 1970s and buy my tennis shoes, buy me Kmart tennis shoes in the 1970s. Did anyone in here wear Kmart tennis shoes in the 1970s? Now here's the thing, do you remember what they, they made them out of? Who's that canvas? Who's that canvas right over here? Can Listen, lady, I would have killed for a canvas pair. You rich kids make me sick. Who said plastic up here? Plastic, listen, listen, my therapist said it's good for us to talk about it, is that right? It was horrible because after like two weeks on the playground, your tennis shoes are cracking like an old garden hose. And you can't fix them because the duct tape just peels right off. Now when we're at the house, talking about the whippings, it is dad's job. The discipline is dad's job at the house if he's there, am I right? And we had a whipping ritual. Did you guys have a whipping ritual at your house? Same thing happened every single time. Dad would grab us by the arm. He'd march us to the back bedroom on the way. He would pick up the implement of whipping. I don't know what it was in your household. My household is either like the belt, the swish, the paddle, uh, sometimes coffee table leg. My parents' attitude was, you're getting a whip and even if some furniture has to die in the process. <laughs> and they're ingenious, that's my point, they can use anything. Remember those little paddle balls? Remember paddle balls? Pop, 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 pop. You find out quick, you better pray that ball stays affixed to that paddle. Because without the ball, it's just a paddle. And you never dream when you're getting these toys for your birthday and Christmas, your parents are going to be beating you with them later. I still break out into a cold sweat whenever I see some of those orange Hot Wheel tracks. <laughs> so we would, we had the ritual, now we had the implement of whipping daddy would go in and he would close the door and he would say the words, bend over. Did anyone in here have to bend over? What is the bending over for? I've been wondering about this all my life because basically it's the same target area. Either way, roughly, but mister, you look pretty smart. Tell me the truth. Basically, we're talking about the same target area. Either way, come on in, come on in. Don't be shy, come on in. I was not a good bender over. I wanted to be a good bender over, but my problem was my rear end was in rebellion. And it would dodge independently of the rest of my body. And it would start on the approach to the bending over spot. Daddy would say, bend over, and it would begin. <laughs> I'm not going to tell you again, son. Thanks, Dad. <laughs> oh, I don't want to touch I had automatic belt radar built in back there, because once the belt started swinging one way, I started going the other. Whoop! Not going to get me. Try again. Miss it. And actually, I found out years later, this is actually a very, very serious medical condition. It's called IFR, which stands for involuntary fanny reflex. Man, oh man. I think one reason, though, I think one reason kids are so spoiled these days. Yes, the lack of, lack of spanking, but not all kids are spoiled, but, but some kids are spoiled these days is because they have so much stuff, don't they? They've got all this stuff. We didn't have this stuff. They had their Nintendos, the PlayStation 2, their own computers, their own cell phones. We didn't have good for them, but we didn't have all that stuff, did we? We had to make our own excitement. You know what we got excited about every night in the Marshall household? You know what we look forward to? Who gets to be the one to bust open the can of biscuits? Remember that? <laughs> I didn't think it's just me. You still like doing it too, don't you? Yes, you did. You had to be careful tearing off that outer layer of paper, though, don't you? It's like trying to diffuse a time bomb. <laughs> <laughs> now i got to wait another week. <laughs> but talk about kids having too much stuff. Now, get this. My next-door neighbor has a son 
that is six years old and he has a CD player, which is not that big of a deal. They come way down in price over the years. But he has a CD collection, a record collection that goes all the way from the floor, almost all the way up to the ceiling at six years old, a record collection. Did you have a record collection when you were six years old? Listen, this is the truth. The only records I had when I was six years old were the ones I had to cut off the back of honeycomb cereal boxes. Remember that sugar? We didn't know any better. We were rocking to the Archies. Of course, they get all these they get all these toys at Christmas. Christmas is always a happy time. When I look back, you know, I, I was so I always got so excited about the, the Christmas stocking. But when I, when I look back, it was a little mystifying, wasn't it? Because I don't know what it was in your household, in my household, like from the calf down to the heel, we had like some mixed nuts, some hard candy that had melted into a softball-sized club <laughs> that I'm pretty sure Santa Claus had picked up in the after Christmas sale at the Blue Light Special. And here's the, the, the weird thing, from the, uh, from the heel down to the toe, we had like an apple, an orange, and a tangerine. Did you guys have that? I said, Mama, I asked my mama about it. I said, Mama, why am I getting fruit for Christmas? She tried to play it off. She goes, well, maybe Santa Claus wants you to eat more healthily. I started to think about that. I started visualizing. And I thought, here's Santa Claus. Ho, ho, ho. And here I am. This is back before I filled out. I'm giving him chocolate chip cookies, he's giving me produce. It's weird. Oh man, I'm learning so much by being a father though, man. It has been so cool being a father. And we're, my, my wife and I were watching television the other night and we're, we TV'd about six hours of uh, Jerry Springer and we're down there. I'm kidding, I'm kidding. We were watching him live. And, uh, and I heard one of the kids cry, cry out from upstairs, so I ran upstairs as fast as I could, as I could and I kind of crouched outside their bedroom doors, my little girl's doors on one side, my little boy's doors on the other side of the hall. And I was listening for them because they both had the drainage down their throats all day long. And a lot of you parents know that once that gets in their stomach, when they lay down at night, a lot of times they can get very nauseous. So sure enough, I heard my little boy cry out again. Turns out that he was very nauseous, as bad nauseous as you can get. So like a loving father, I sprang in the action. I jumped into the action right there. I said, honey, better get on up here. Better put a move on. Hurry up, bring the big bucket, baby. This ain't getting better. I let me tell you, dads have a different standard of child care than moms. Am I telling you anything you don't know? Am I telling you? I'm just saying, because, because listen, listen, let me illustrate this. Her standard is that the kids have to eat a full meal, which consists of two vegetables and a meat, drink all their milk, get them upstairs, brush those teeth, get them into the bathtub, scrub every square inch of their body, so dry them off, get them into their, their jammies, get them to bed, say their prayers in bed on time. That is mom's standard. She might not always make it, but that's her standard. Men, we have a slightly different standard, don't we? Our standard is just make sure the kids are still alive when mom gets home. <laughs> That's only because we're scared of mom. <laughs> it's hard. And, and defense of me, it's hard taking care of kids. I've done it. Because you can watch them all day long and they don't move. But I've noticed you take your eyes off of them for like two or three hours and they're gone. <laughs> Weird. So we did, I'm kidding, both of us, my wife and I went into my little boy's room and we just ministered to him, we cleaned him up, he was feeling horrible, we just, we loved on him, we wiped him off and we took care of him because we love our children, we love our kids, and I believe that when we get in trouble, we have a Heavenly Father that loves us. I believe that our Heavenly Father cares when we get in physical trouble. I believe we have a Heavenly Father that cares when we get in spiritual trouble. I believe our Father cares when we get into financial trouble. I don't know how bad a financial trouble you've ever been in, but my wife and I, when we first started on this path, we, a number of years ago, there were times when we didn't know whether we were going to have enough food to eat. Have you ever been there? We didn't know. And, and I, I remember there's this, like on a Monday, <clears throat> 
We, uh, we found out that we didn't have enough, uh, we weren't going to have enough food to make it to the end of the week. So my wife and I just bowed our heads and we prayed about it. It wasn't anything elegant. It wasn't anything highly spiritual. We just bowed it and said a simple prayer and basically forgot about it. A couple days later, things are starting to get bad now. We, we're running out of food for real. We're having it at, out at our church and it was a children's function. It gets to the end of the, the event and we're standing around with the other volunteers and we're standing around with the pastor and his wife and everybody's talking together. You know how you do that? And it, they are lamenting about how they overordered the amount, overestimated the amount of food they would need for that event. And they're going, oh my goodness, what are we going to do with all this food? I don't know. Why don't, why don't we, we don't want to throw it away. What, are, what can we do with all this food? And can you believe I didn't speak up? That such was my pride. This is true. I didn't, I didn't speak up. I, I was praying silently. I did one of those ventriloquist prayers. Lord Jesus, please let them look over here and offer that food to me. And I don't know if it's because the pastor's wife is a very spiritual lady. She can hear God or, it, or I'm just a really loud ventriloquist prayer or something. But... But at that very moment, she looked over at me and she goes, Charles, honest to goodness, she, she looked over at me and she goes, Charles, could you guys use this food? And I'm telling you the truth, I said something like, well, I'll take it off your hands if you want me to. I'm willing to help out my church. I'll, I'll step up and help out. I'm a good volunteer. I'm not going to leave you guys in the lurch. And we took that food home and we wrapped it up. It was hot dogs and we put it in the freezer. Have you ever had a hundred of anything? Be honest. Have you ever? <laughs> Did you just feel rich? Can you feel rich? I'm telling you the truth. I would go out throughout the day. I would go over and, and open up the freezer door and I'd look at all these hot dogs. I felt like Ben Cartwright surveying the Ponderosa. <laughs> this is my estate right here. And we had the best time with those hot dogs, though, man. We would invite friends over for a weenie roast, and, and we just shared the story over and over and over about the goodness and the faithfulness and the kindness of God and how He can provide if you will just trust Him. And a lot of people, when I tell that story, a lot of people will say to me, but Charles, hot dogs are high in cholesterol. Don't you know that? <laughs> They do. I get that comment. But let me just tell you this. I, that bothered me too, but I did some scientific research. And I think it will comfort you to know that I learned that it's actually better for you to eat hot dogs just packed full of cholesterol than it is for you to starve cholesterol free. <laughs> Does that make sense? And I, I love going all over the country talking about the goodness of God and all the miracles God has done. I'm sure you have some great stories too, but as I look back in my spiritual journey, I, I, I believe the biggest miracle God has done for me is the miracle of transformation. When I realized that there is no life outside of Jesus, I knelt down on my knees and I said, Lord, if you can do something better with my life, I want to give it to you tonight. And now, get this, here's a miracle for you. He took that kid with no college education and he turned him into a guy that travels all across the country telling people about the goodness and faithfulness of the Lord. Can God do miracles? Absolutely. Absolutely. He is big enough. And I, I love being a dad because being a dad teaches me so much about the father heart of God. God is big enough and, and it teaches me that if I care about my kids, then I, I, I can believe that God cares about me. I got involved when my kids were born. It, 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 I, I changed diapers. Did any of you guys change diapers when your kids were? Oh, ladies, give them a hand. Give those guys right there a hand. Sounded a little weak. Don't you think that was weak? A little weak? Like you're thinking, big stinking deal. You changed the diaper, good for you. I marked it down on the calendar, I did. I did, I, I stepped up, I changed diapers every single day I was the, at the house, I changed diapers. And listen, that is no idle boast because most of my baby's diapers were just like luxury vehicles, they came fully loaded with all the accessories. Do we have any, anybody in here with your baby still in diapers? Anybody can I see your hand? Anybody at all? You, you got baby still in diapers? Can I ask you what type of diaper disposal system you guys use? What type of, uh, just, just kind of throw it over against the wall. And just, if, the, if the pile gets big enough, just switch to another room. Is that right? 
Yeah, you say it in a trash can, right? Right? Wait, you, you use that? Anybody else? Anybody got, got a little baby? What, what, do you, what diaper disposal system do you use? The garage. So you throw it over into the garage. So you're one step. Oh, so you think you're better than them. I do. All right. All right. All right. Maybe they live in a different trailer park. You don't know. You don't know. Don't be so uppity. I'm going to interrupt myself to tell you this, this story. I, I, I do all types of events, and I'm driving out in rural Georgia around Halloween. And you know how you see a lot of haunted houses and everything? I'm driving, and I see a bunch of people standing on the side of the road in a line out in rural Georgia somewhere. And I saw this sign. I'm not kidding about this. It said, This Way to Haunted Trailer. <laughs> I thought, what kind of terror do they have awaiting the trailer dweller? They have a bunch of people pushing on the side saying, oh, it's a twister! It's a twister! <laughs> Seemed kind of weird, I thought. But that's the right answer. The, the trash can, you can't have anything better than that. My wife and I, we got one of those diaper genies. Anybody use the diaper genie in here? Did you like the diaper genie? See, I did not like the diaper genie because it, it did not work. I wanted to use it. For those of you who don't, don't know what the diaper genie is, it's a diaper pail with a little mechanism on the top whereby you stick the offending diaper down in it, you turn it around, and it keeps the offensive odor out of the nursery. And I thought, wow, that sounds great. And after, you, after it fills up, you can pull them out and you get the these little diaper sausage links and they're just they're they're wonderful because you can use them to decorate at Christmas or you can stuff throw pillows with them they have no end of use and I was so excited about it until the first time that I used it and, and here's the scenario I'm, my, my daughter is is on the changing table and she's kind of rolling around I don't have her strapped in and, and she's done one of those fully loaded luxury vehicle diapers she's still messy and, and that's when I noticed that the hole that you stick the diaper in on the diaper genie at least back then was about that big most fully loaded luxury vehicle diapers though are about that big that's called a physics problem right there if I didn't know what to do, I'm stuffing it down there. I'm really stressed out. She's rolling around. I didn't know what to do. I squeezed, and I was, I was in the trenches. I was under enemy fire. So I stuck it down there, and that's when I found out that the diaper genie has teeth that hold the diaper in. And now I can't get my hand out. I'm going around the nursery. I can't get out. Finally, I pull it out, but now I've got a brand new problem. I'm walking around the nursery thinking, what on earth am I going to do? I don't know. Oh man, oh man. But things change. Things change. When you have a baby, your relationship changes. This is true. It changed everything. You men need to know this. I found this out when I changed a diaper. I came in and I, and I said, honey, I just changed a diaper. She goes, did she do anything? I go, yes. Yeah. She goes, how much? <laughs> well, I never developed any vocabulary to have this conversation. I don't know. Are there units of measure or what? I said, I don't know, honey, not very much. She goes, well, I need to know. It's important for the health of the child. I said, honey, I don't know, not much. She goes, well, I need some idea. I said, I don't know. She said, well, you need to give me some. I said, maybe, maybe like a junior man. <laughs> the weird thing is she seemed satisfied with that answer. <laughs> Next day, same thing. I, go, I change the diaper. I go in there. I'm telling you, this is a true story. I, I go in there. And she goes, how'd she do today, honey? I said, oh, honey, I don't know, not much. She goes, well, was it like a junior mint? I said, no, today is more like a York peppermint patty. <laughs> well, the next day, I decided to go prepared. Because my daughter does one of those fully loaded luxury vehicle diapers, and I decided to name this one something in keeping with the dessert theme. And I decided I would name it after my wife's favorite Outback Steakhouse dessert. And I went in there, she goes, how'd she do today, honey? I said, honey, today she did a chocolate thunder down under. <laughs> she said, we ain't calling it that. You guys have been wonderful. Thank you so much. God bless you. Thank you. Good night.